Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is William Hayden. I'm director of ACC International Programs, and welcome to tonight's Global Issues Speaker Series. We are fortunate to have a guest speaker from University of Strasbourg, Strasbourg, France, Dr. Guillaume Potroquet, a professor of American Studies, um, who will be talking about societal and economic changes in the U.S. and Europe, sort of with a special focus on the unique Trump Macron relationship. Um, so I hope everybody enjoys that. Uh, we will have a Q&A afterwards. And then for those of you who are here for extra credit, we have extra credit slips that we'll pass out at the end. So um, we also have uh, Ted Hadziancic, the chair of the government department, who'd like to say a couple of words before we get started. Thank you, William. Thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to uh, just tell you a little, uh, briefly about uh, Guillaume, uh, who uh, we work with in our uh, political science study abroad program, partnered with the University of Strasbourg. Uh, Guillaume is Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Strasbourg, France. He holds a PhD in American Studies from uh, Université Paris III, Sorbonne Nouvelle. He teaches American history and political science classes at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and his research interests include language diversity and historiography. And uh, when we work together in, uh, in France at the university with our political science program, uh, we, uh, we, we bring his students into our classroom and uh, uh, we study the Supreme Court cases, uh, we read uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, and it's a really wonderful, engaging experience uh, with, uh, with, with French students. So we're very happy to uh, invite him to Austin, Texas, and uh, thank you uh, very much for joining us, uh, and I'll leave it over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Let's move this thing up. All right, so uh, again, I'd like, I'd like to thank Ted and William for having me. It's such an honor, a privilege to be here and give a presentation on a topical subject that uh, strange, unusual relationship between two presidents, the French president and the US president, Emmanuel Macron and Donald Trump. Um, so I'll do a one hour presentation uh, maximum and the, the one thing I'm looking forward is a discussion with you and how you understand these issues and uh, I'll focus mostly on the French uh, political system and the French presidency and the French election because I grant that your knowledge of the US political system and the US uh, election of 2016 is, is, is substantial. You've lived it, you voted in it, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll, of course I'll, I'll give you my take on, on it, but uh, I'll rather spend more time describing events that you're not probably not familiar with. Okay, uh, let's uh, begin with the, the first uh, slide. Okay, I, I want to show you two maps because they're important. Uh, you must bear these in mind to understand some of the uh, differences between the two presidents. Okay, the first one gives you a sense of scale. Uh, Texas is uh, about the size of France. It's actually bigger, of course, there's no arguing. Geographically, it is bigger, uh, but it's less populated. 28 million inhabitants in Texas versus 67 million for uh, France. The second is a map of the uh, European Union of its 27 uh, member states. The UK is on its way out, so we will be 26, but other um, countries are applying to join the EU. Uh, the f countries that used to be part of Yugoslavia in particular. So people, as you know, people and goods move freely within the EU and the control of the external borders of the EU is the responsibility of those member states located on these borders. They get some funding from the EU to fulfill that mission. So these two maps give you a sense of scale and a, a sense of the situation of France within the European Union and how the problem of borders and controlling those borders um, is different in, um, for the French. Okay, so as I mentioned very briefly, I'd like to uh, discuss the outcomes of two recent presidential elections today, the US election of 2016 and the French election of 2017. Six months separate the two events. The French election was held in the month of May of 2017. 
And um, I want to ask, uh, address a question, a, a fairly simple question. What do these elections tell us about the United States and France? And what do these elections tell us about uh, democracies and how they cope with uh, that uh, important uh, set of changes we call uh, globalization, for lack of a better term? So the period under study in this presentation begins in 2015 and ends in 2017. I will not discuss the outcome of the midterm election, uh, but I may refer to it and, and will probably um, um, discuss the, the, the midterm elections during the Q&A session. So to compare and contrast, the two countries has long been a staple among uh, historians and political scientists on both sides of the Atlantic. And today, uh, I want to use that comparison to demonstrate the relevance of that comparison. Uh, for France and the United States share much of their political DNA. They were born at the end of the uh, 18th century, and they've been allies ever since with ups and downs. I'm cutting, long, uh, uh, I'm cutting short, um, a long story short here. Um, so born at the end of the 18th century, uh, allies ever since they are sister republics, I want to argue, sister republics built on the same principles, namely democracy, the rule of law, and the separation of church and state, which is uh, very important for um, the French and how they relate to their institutions. And both countries, France and the United States, have had and have a claim to exceptionalism, a fact that explains their uh, complicated relationship built on cooperation and competition. Uh, actually, I would suggest that France and the United States have had a brother and sister kind of relationship that just love to argue. Um, I must also uh, say that France and the United States lend themselves to comparisons to a certain extent only because several factors such as federalism and racial diversity and how it is dealt with politically in the US clearly differentiate the two. So comparison is relevant to a certain extent only. The size of the United States also, the size of its population, its abundant natural resources compound the problem of comparison. So sometimes to compare the United States with the European Union as a whole is more relevant. Okay, I have two uh, photos on this slide uh, that uh, uh, show uh, the first meeting of Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron they first met uh, in the month of May 2017 in Brussels, uh, and the occasion was a, a NATO summit. And you probably remember that story, the two shook hands, and shaking hands with Donald Trump is a test of one's leadership skills. The U.S. president assesses his counterparts' personalities by squeezing their hands. The French president had prepared uh, for this critical moment and passed these first tests with flying colors. He actually had a coach to uh, teach him how to prepare him for that uh, first encounter with the U.S. president. So that uh, first handshake was widely commented in the press, and uh, I did a bit of an online research uh, and found this uh, uh, piece from the English tabloid uh, Daily Express entitled emphatically, Trump handshake backfires as Macron leaves white marks on president's hands. Okay, so the, 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 the hand of uh, the, the U.S. president was analyzed uh, by journalists after that first meeting. So, and and their the body language, as a, in general, has been scrutinized ever since. And their relationship uh, was quickly uh, dubbed a bromance, a term that I did not know before that uh, encounter. And that bromance with its many ups and downs, puzzles, and surprises observers. The two men are quite different. In many respects, they are just the opposite. Um, their age, one trivia, the age difference between the two men and their respective spouses is the same, but in reverse. Emmanuel Macron married his former French high school teacher. He was then 30, she was 54, and Mr. Trump married Mrs. Trump when uh, he was 59 and she was 35. Okay, so that's a, just a, a quick observation, but that you know, um, contributes to this uh, analysis that the men are two, uh, just the, the opposite. 
Uh, another, in more, more generally speaking, Macron is said to be a modern, liberal president with an international outlook. He's an eloquent orator, he's an avid reader. And all these characteristics are used to contrast his personality to that of uh, Donald Trump. Yet the two presidents have much in common. As my title suggests, both were, are and were, um, unlikely, unexpected presidents. They were outsiders, they were mavericks uh, when they declared their um, candidacy for the presidency. And my preliminary conclusion or the argument that I want to develop today is uh, that their elections testify to the fundamental transformations of the world we live in. That is to say, uh, that's transformations we may call globalization again for lack of a better term, and by globalization I mean an increasingly integrated global economy, the internet revolution and its social implications. But again, this, is, this needs to be um, elaborated. So my dependent variable are the two elections considered together, and my independent variable are the political environments in which they happen, their party systems, the political landscapes in which they happen. And I will suggest that uh, these two elections may herald new party systems. Uh, but uh, it's too early to tell that for sure uh, this is the, that these two elections um, are uh, elections that um, are the basis of new party systems. The next presidential elections of, of, uh, in the US in 2020 um, and uh, the one in 2022 in France will give us a better idea of where we're headed. So we need to wait a little until we can say for sure that we have new party systems in France and the United States. Um, so I want to uh, give you a bit of an overview of the French uh, political system, of uh, French uh, political institutions, and I want to do that in a way that is uh, bearable, okay? I don't want to give you a headache. I just have three days for you. Um, the first one is the year 1958. That's the year when a new constitution was adopted uh, for uh, France. It's uh, the fifth constitution. It's therefore the constitution that created the fifth republic. That's how the French uh, refer to their political system. And we are currently in the fifth republic. So 1958, a new constitution, a constitution of the Fifth Republic. Uh, just a quick word about the previous one and, and why it was um, shed. The previous one had been adopted in 1946. It had created a parliamentary regime. Uh, this uh, proved a quite unstable regime as the French National Assembly regularly dismissed the cabinet put together by the prime minister. Political instability was, uh, was chronic, and um, this happened at a time when the French colonial empire uh, was uh, falling apart. Uh, and um, this um, political instability plus decolonization precipitated the demise of the Fourth Republic. So the new constitution was designed to put an end to this chronic instability and it was also tailored to uh, the personality of Charles de Gaulle, uh, the leader of the Free French uh, during World War II, a man I would describe as the George Washington of post-war France. And um, he had his uh, political party to support uh, him in this endeavor to uh, create a new uh, republic. So the Fifth Republic was uh, created to meet the needs of uh, Charles de Gaulle and his uh, political uh, party, and it created basically a, a semi-presidential regime. Um, the French president is elected for a five-year term, originally it was seven, and um, is directly elected by the French people. Okay. The head of state, the French president, controls the armed forces, uh, the, the nuclear arsenal of France, uh, he can dissolve parliament, hold referendums on laws uh, or on matters that pertain to the French constitution. And in the Fifth Republic, 
Uh, we have a unique system in the sense that the president appoints a prime minister who uh, uh, puts together a cabinet and who uh, leads the legislative branch of government, who leads the French parliament, which is a bicameral legislature with a senate and an assembly, a national assembly. And that prime minister introduces a majority of the bills in parliament. So that's the reason why we call this uh, regime uh, a semi-presidential regime. But when you think twice, the fact that the president appoints a prime minister who introduces a majority of bills in the French National Assembly um, is, I would call this uh, a presidential regime period. Uh, two things about the French voting system that was created uh, by this 1958 Fifth Republic. Um, it's actually a voting system that was, uh, that was um, created in 1962. Uh, it's a fairly simple voting system for presidential elections. It's a two-round system, also known as runoff <coughs> voting. So what French voters do for, uh, on the, for presidential elections, they cast a single vote for their chosen candidate. And if no candidate receives uh, uh, an absolute majority, that is to say 50% of the votes, all but the two candidates receive the most votes are eliminated in a second round of voting is held and the French have to choose between two candidates. So you may wonder, how did this institution serve the purpose of de Gaulle and his political party? Well, it created a remarkably stable political system one that allowed the two major parties to succeed each other uh, to the Elysee Palace, where the, the president is, uh, um, is, um, is, uh, is uh, hosted. Um, and um, so it created a remarkably stable political system. It also uh, gave de Gaulle and his uh, allies uh, an advantage. Um, he uh, and his allies could easily form a coalition in the National Assembly and support a single candidate for the presidency. And this system was also designed to put the Socialist Party of France in a difficult position. That is to say that uh, the Socialist Party had to uh, uh, ally itself to the Communist Party to uh, stand a chance at winning a presidential election or a majority in the National Assembly. Uh, after 1956, the image of the Communist Party in France uh, was uh, deteriorated as a result of this uh, suppression of the uh, Hungarian uh, uprising by the Red Army, and the French New Left emerged out of uh, this, um, this uh, episode. So from 1958 to 1981, uh, things worked well for uh, the goal and his followers, all French presidents were leaders of right-wing parties. Uh, yet uh, such uh, right-wing parties ruled from the center and the Socialist Party that won the presidential election in 1981 continued in this, uh, in this uh, manner, ruling from the center. This uh, rather stable political environment uh, started to change in the 1980s. It's hard to say exactly when uh, this um, balance uh, was upset. I have here uh, a, a graph that shows the makeup of the National Assembly in 1986, and it's just there to give you a sense of the, uh, uh, the balance of power between the right and the left. You had a, a coalition of right-wing parties, the UDF and RPR. I won't give you the details of the acronyms and what they stand for. Um, doesn't really matter. And you have, uh, with 212 seats, the Socialist Party and the one fraction uh, of, uh, the one red fraction uh, with 35 seats are the Communist Party. And in the 1980s, a new party, well, not fundamentally new, it had been around for more than a decade then, uh, started to disrupt that balance between left and right, and that was the uh, Front National, the National Front, a nationalist uh, xenophobic party that uh, managed to uh, gain seats in the National Assembly. Um, the, 
outcome of, uh, so, so 1980s, in a context um, that was that of the end of the Cold War, this uh, political landscape, this party system started to be um, a question, started to uh, be put under pressure. The next step that uh, I want to discuss very briefly, um, and it's probably the moment, the, big, the very beginning of the end for that party system, uh, the next step that led to the breakup of that French party system occurred in 2005, when the French uh, referendum on the treaty establishing a constitution for Europe was held. Now, the, the European Union, um, uh, members of the uh, European Union discussed uh, in the 1990s the need to further integrate uh, Europe and have something that would look like a European constitution. And uh, a constitution was drafted and it was submitted to uh, the vote of the French people in a referendum. And the question that the French were asked to answer in 2005 was as follows. Do you approve of uh, the bill authorizing the ratification of a treaty for establishing the constitution for for Europe. But the real question uh, French voters uh, answered was, do you approve of globalization? Do you approve, of, do you want France to be a member state of a federation that promotes free trade and abolishes borders? And uh, with that set of questions in mind, uh, the French rejected the treaties, voted no in 2005. And this was um, a political earthquake in Europe because France had been this uh, founding member of uh, the European Union, is said to be the engine of uh, the European Union, of the integration of the European Union along with Germany. And so that was the beginning of the end for this uh, project, for this treaty. Well, not exactly, I'll say a few things uh, later. But uh, this uh, was, in many respects, the end of a, um, of a party system in France that uh, used to oppose the left and the right to um, a new system where people who were uh, pro-European Union, pro-free uh, market liberalism, opposed those who were in favor of maintaining the borders of France intact, who uh, favored tariffs, who uh, favored uh, a more traditional uh, definition of, of France. The, uh, the, 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 the next um, episode, the, the end of this uh, treaty, the treaty was rejected by the French people. It was also rejected by the Dutch, who voted in a referendum, and after that, countries uh, uh, cancel their referendums or their votes on, on the treaty, knowing that it was, was gone for good. Two years later, uh, this uh, treaty was redrawn uh, and uh, uh, called the Treaty of Lisbon, and that Treaty of Lisbon was adopted by France and many other countries without a referendum. And this was denounced by many people, especially those who had voted against the treaty, as a betrayal, as a very undemocratic move. After all, if you say no in a referendum, no means no, and there's no reason why a government should uh, vote uh, contrary to the outcome of this referendum. So this further shook the foundations of that French party system that used to oppose the left and the right. The two uh, parties, uh, the right-wing party and the left-wing party, had campaigned in favor of the treaty, and the right-wing party in office in 2007 is the one that uh, pushed for the adoption of the Treaty of Lisbon. So uh, the existing political parties, the two major political parties, were heavily contested um, uh, because of their stance on this treaty and on, because of the, the decision of the... Um, a French uh, right-wing party to ignore popular uh, opinion and, and adopt uh, a, a treaty for the European Union. So um, let's move to uh, 2017. 
that's the next uh, step. That's the beginning, uh, can be uh, the beginning of a new party system. The 2017 election was a different election uh, for many reasons. It's, it was an election which for the first time uh, used uh, primary elections. That's a novelty in France. The first uh, primary election was held in 2012 for um, the Socialist Party. And uh, five years later, uh, and the Socialist Party won the election in 2012. François Hollande was the president for five years. And um, because this had worked for the Socialist Party, the, the right-wing party uh, thought, well, it's a good idea. We'll, we'll use this primary uh, election system to uh, appoint the right uh, candidate, to appoint the right candidate to win the election. So this was uh, uh, under the influence of the United States. And the, the, the American example was... Uh, uh, cited and, and studied, and the French uh, uh, experimented with primaries in uh, 2012 and 2017. Um, I will I will be surprised to see the French uh, parties use primaries in the next elections because instead of uh, uh, solidifying the parties instead of making them more open, more democratic, more uh, representative of popular opinion, uh, the, the, the primaries in France in 2017 had just the opposite effect. They shook the parties so hard that uh, these parties are uh, lame duck political parties. They're pretty much, uh, we're not sure they will uh, survive um, the next presidential election. So um, the, uh, the situation in 2017 was uh, unusual. We had uh, primaries for the Socialist Party, which is, again, the uh, left-wing party, uh, and Les Républicains is the right-wing party. That's the new name of the right-wing party. Um, I want to uh, uh, say a few things about the differences between the two uh, the, the French Republican Party in no way corresponds to the U.S. Republican Party. Okay, the, the, this is um, deceiving. Um, if you want to uh, understand where the two parties uh, stand, think of the Socialist Party as a party uh, uh, of liberals, of American liberals, and uh, the Republican Party would be a party of uh, centrist Democrats or blue dog Democrats. But there is no real equivalent to the Republican Party in France. Um, uh, the ideas of the, the Republicans can be found here and there, but they're scattered over uh, a number of parties. So uh, who, was, uh, who do we see on this picture? We see a number of candidates. Not all of them are... Uh, members of the Socialist Party of the Republican Party, but we had 12 plus candidates in the first round of the uh, 2017 presidential primary. So uh, let's take a look at what happened in the Socialist Party, the, the uh, left-wing party. We had two candidates, Emmanuel Valls and Benoit Hamon. Uh, Emmanuel Valls was a former prime minister who um, was very much of a centrist. He liberalized the labor market he was tough on law and order. He had that image as a mayor of a suburban uh, city called Evry. And the question was, is he a real socialist? Many people question his being a, a socialist. Uh, he was uh, something else, but people did not really know how to call him. And he uh, was, uh, his opponent is a man called Benoit Hamon. He's a former, he was a former cabinet member who ran on a radical left-wing platform with a universal income uh, at, at its center. And the question that many French people asked themselves was, does he seriously believe he can win the primary and the election with that universal income ID? So we had, within the Socialist Party, two people who uh, were on the fringes of this Socialist Party, politically speaking. One was at the very center, so close to the center that he no longer 
deserved that label, people felt, and the other one was so radical that he was uh, identified uh, almost as a, as a communist or someone who was, you know, outside, who deserved, who belonged outside of this socialist party. Uh, Les Républicains, the right-wing party, uh, saw a similar confrontation between two men who challenged the party from the inside, but with um, a, a similar uh, intensity. Alain Juppé uh, is uh, the equivalent of Emmanuel Valls for the, um, for the uh, Republican Party. He was, he's a former prime minister too. He uh, was a, uh, he's the mayor of Bordeaux and he ran on a centrist uh, platform as a reformer. Actually, he was very popular because he didn't say much. And so people believed that you know, he would be uh, the right candidate, uh, but because they thought they agreed with him. That was very clever from, from his part. And um, his um, opponent, François Fillon, was also a former prime minister under the presidency of Nicolas Sarkozy. And he ran on a classic fiscal conservative platform. He promised to slash uh, public spendings, cut thousands of government jobs, etc. And so again, none of these two uh, candidates really fit within this uh, Republican Party. They were on the fringes of the party. They challenged the party from the inside, but again with a, uh, uh, an incredible uh, intensity in a way that was... Uh, uh, very unusual. And two other uh, men challenged their own parties from the outside. They understood that uh, the French party system was becoming irrelevant and that uh, the future did not lay within the traditional existing parties but outside of the parties. Okay, And that uh, for uh, that, that success would come at a price, and that price was to kill existing parties, would be to kill existing parties. So we have two outsiders, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who uh, stands for a movement, uh, originally a movement called Les Insoumis, those who refuse to submit. Okay? Uh, he uh, is, a, is a senator, he's a former member of the Socialist Party, but he uh, uh, defected and created his own movement. And so he ran on a platform uh, that is um, an odd mix of um, constitutional reform. He wants a sixth republic to reinstall a parliamentary regime. Uh, he wants to increase taxes and um, have the French welfare state play a bigger role. He wants uh, EU tariffs. He wants, uh, he's basically against any uh, uh, free trade treaty. He's also in favor of an EU budget that would assume the debt of those European countries um, that struggle with, uh, with their own national debt, such as Greece, such as Portugal and Spain during the uh, uh, 2010s, in the previous decade, I mean. And Jean-Luc Mélenchon is a man who's very much described as a populist, and that's a term I'm a bit uncomfortable with because I'm not sure what it means. It means several things, and depending on what you uh, put in this uh, world, um, it applies to him. Uh, the other, so we'll discuss maybe populism um, after, during the Q&A session, if it's a relevant term or not. And the last challenger was Emmanuel Macron. And just uh, um, and Emmanuel Macron is a man who was uh, unknown to the public uh, in uh, 2015. Uh, uh, he was uh, appointed that year, actually in 2014. Sorry, he was unknown in 2014 when he was appointed Minister of Economy, Industry, and uh, Digital Affairs. That was his uh, his uh, his uh, cabinet. And he resigned two years later after a contentious two-year uh, um, period during which he challenged the president, the French president, when he questioned the validity of the choices of the government, of the, of the socialist party in general. 
And in 2016, he launched a uh, bid in the presidential election. He started a movement, a political movement called En, en Marche, which means onward, let's go, let's get going. And his program was fairly vague and fairly simple, uh, economic liberalism at home and further integration of the EU to protect European economies. So that's the situation um, before the presidential election in 2017, a challenge of existing political parties from the inside and from the outside. Uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, faced Marine Le Pen of the, the National Front um, in, um, in the second round of voting in the runoff and he easily won with 60% of the vote. Many people voted for him not to have Marine Le Pen run France. Okay? She uh, remains very unpopular. She remains perceived as a, as a threat to democracy, integrity of France, integrity of the European Union. And, and I think it's, it's true that she is a threat. Uh, so 60% of the votes in the 2017 runoff, shortly after the French had their legislative election and uh, a majority in both chambers. And the outcome of this election is a new um, uh, set of opposition between politicians, between uh, political parties, political movements, uh, instead of a left versus right um, opposition, we have now an opposition between a group of people we could call liberals and a group of people we could call conservatives. Uh, the, um, so that's really what we have now, uh, a new political landscape and possibly if it solidifies uh, a new political, a new party system with uh, again a group of conservatives that would include uh, Marine Le Pen of the uh, far right, uh, Mélenchon of the far left, and a group of, uh, of liberals, of uh, uh, people like uh, Emmanuel Macron and his followers. He now has a political party called La République En Marche, which is uh, the party that was born out of the En Marche movement. Uh, and um, these, uh, this political uh, configuration is putting a, a great amount of pressure on the Socialist Party and the right-wing party that, that remain. Um, and it's unclear whether these two will survive or will uh, join uh, the centrist or liberal uh, party of uh, Emmanuel Macron or the conservatives. It's very likely, uh, it's, a, it's a possibility that the French right-wing party will split into uh, factions, one that will be part of La République en Marche and the, uh, La République en Marche, Emmanuel Macron, and the other one uh, will join the ranks of the Front National, which has a new name now. Uh, a political uh, commentator called Philippe Reynaud, he's a constitutional scholar, uh, makes a comparison between um, Whigs and Tories. He said, we are now in a political landscape that resembles that of uh, England in the 18th century, we have Whigs and Tories. So the question that I'm asking myself and that you probably see now is, uh, um, are we moving from parties to movement? Is it a trend that can be said to characterize um, the French political uh, system or the German political system that is experiencing um, you know, a similar evolution with the, the traditional parties being contested by a new right-wing party called uh, Alternative für Deutschland. Um, it's hard to tell because, you know, the difference between a political party and a, 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 a political movement is paper thin. A movement seeks to influence, a, a party seeks to get elected. Um, but it's a, a question that remains open. Movement and political parties. What about the United States? Where does the U.S. fit in this, uh, in this uh, evolution that, I, um, that I've described for, for, the, for the, the, the French case? Well, you may say that Trump, uh, Donald Trump challenged the Republican Party 
uh, from the inside. He uh, was assisted in this endeavor uh, by the, the Tea Party movement. The Tea Party movement may be said to have paved the way for the victory of Donald Trump. Um, what distinguishes the Tea Party Republicans in the House is not, so, is not so much their views on fiscal issues, but their views on social and racial issues. Um, House members that are aligned with the Tea Party are more socially and, ra ra um, and racially sorry, conservative than other Republicans. Uh, and the Tea Party is also um, a movement that paved the way for the victory of Trump and the leadership of Donald Trump in how it uh, communicates. The rhetoric of the Tea Party movement, I find, is very close to that of Donald Trump. It's, uh, it's blunt, it's confrontational, it's divisive, it's meant to drive a wedge between, uh, between people. Um, the, uh, so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, 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 the distinction that we may make between uh, a movement and a party. Um, the um, situation, the, another similarity between the two or the two situations I find is how the two address globalization. Okay, they, their elections testify to broader changes um, and how and these changes have affected party systems in France, in Europe, and possibly in the United States. And the two have uh, in common, I will argue, a, um, a priority which is to address globalization. Now they do that in very different ways. Okay, that's, that's, there's no questioning that the two can be said to be just the opposite when it comes to globalization. Uh, Emmanuel Macron favors multilateralism, a multilateral approach to uh, solving um, the problems that France uh, faces within the European Union with the European Union when Donald Trump has this uh, unilateral America first policy. But the two uh, have in common this, uh, um, um, this uh, uh, the importance they pay to such matters, to such an issue, how to reposition their own countries on the uh, world stage. And Macron cannot play the France, uh, France first card. Uh, instead, he's attempting to establish his leadership on the EU in order to turn the EU as um, um, a federation. He's a federalist that will uh, promote French interests, that will uh, protect uh, France. So um, this... Um, um, Okay, addressing globalization. Another similarity that I see between the two, but it has to do with, a, with, a, a sub, with shape rather than substance, is their uh, managerial techniques. Um, Donald Trump is, uh, uh, presents himself as a CEO when he ran on this notion that I am a, a used to be, uh, was, I'm still, I still am a successful CEO and I will use these um, management techniques to um, give America a better deal. And Emmanuel Macron uh, has had a brief career in investment banking and he's a big admirer of uh, startups. And he uh, organized and ran his movements as a startup and he wants to instill that startup uh, spirit, that startup management technique in French, uh, in French politics and in France in general. So they both have this uh, private sector um, 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 past with them as a means to assert their, uh, um, their authority and their difference with the existing politicians. A big question that I still, that I, that I ask myself on a regular basis and I'll be happy to hear you uh, answer it, is that of the relationship between Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Is Donald Trump a Republican? Is he a true Republican? How come is he still uh, endorsed by uh, the Republican Party and uh, the, uh, uh, after the, the numerous uh, scandals that uh, marked his first two year, uh, years in office? Um, so that's a, a, a question. Uh, but 
the relationship between uh, Donald Trump and the Republican Party is an unusual one, just like the relationship between Emmanuel Macron and his political party is unusual. Is unusual. Okay, so let's uh, wrap it up uh, briefly by uh, concluding by, by this observation. The two leaders uh, stunned the world by winning elections in a regular yet unorthodox manner. They both understood that the structural oppositions between existing political parties had become irrelevant. Because of the nature of U.S. electoral laws, Trump could not uh, launch his own third party, although he was greatly assisted by the Tea Party movement. And Macron was able to successfully turn his En Marche movement into a regular political party. And ever since, the two leaders have a complicated, uh, fragile relationship with their parties now that they are in office. A number of senior members of uh, uh, Macron's party defected uh, in the first year. Um, so uh, are they, are they, what's the future uh, for these two? What's the future for this? Will they continue their bromance? Will they continue to collaborate in a way that is surprising, unusual? What are the prospects for the US-Friends partnership? And I have this uh, photograph of the two sharing a laugh, and it's hard to say whether they're laughing together or at each other. Um, my suggestion is that they will continue to cooperate because the two countries have always needed to cooperate. Uh, and um, the portrait of Lafayette uh, that we we'll see on this uh, photograph will remain uh, in the White House for a long time. So I expect further ups and downs, further uh, twists and turns in that uh, bromance and um, a cooperation between these two unlikely leaders. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, anyone? Thank you very much, sir. Um, was there much discussion, whether amongst academics or folks in France prior to the brief initiation of this, quote, primary system, given that the United States has essentially a two-party system and your country has a multi-party system and the mechanics of whether or not that would actually work. Was there much discussion of that prior to the election? As far as I can remember, no. These primary, uh, primary elections are used by the two major political parties only. Um, and, um, you know, there was, there was a, a debate. Uh, uh, between those who saw such primary elections as a U.S. import that would, you know, not fit well with the, uh, the, the French political tradition, um, but uh, it, it, it's my answer to you was that it seemed like a, like a way to modernize those two parties of putting uh, France in line with the United States, which is uh, considered as a, has long been considered a symbol of modernity, of the future, basically. So if you want to uh, think of the future, look at what goes on in the United States. It's been like that for forever, pretty much, uh, since the French Revolution, uh, with the US and the French Revolution. So, um, But it's very unlikely that these primaries will be organized because they, you know, they killed the Republican Party. They, killed the, uh, the Socialist Party. The one thing I did not mention about this, uh, uh, the Republican Party in 2017, uh, the man who won the primary election, François Fillon, um, um, it appeared, it, it, it was revealed to the public that he had employed his wife as a parliamentary aide for years and, and she never did, she never worked for him. Okay, she was paid to stay at home and she was paid 6,000 euros a month to stay at home. So that uh, put him in a very awkward position and he was a, a lame duck candidate um, in 2017. So that also paved the way for the victory of Macron, but uh, um, it's very hard to tell whether things would have been different without that scandal. In reference to globalization for both these two countries, in the United States, we have a segment of our society who believes that globalization 
is causing the average American to lose jobs because it's being taken by other country nationalities. Do you have that same oh, problem yes. in France? And Absolutely. how extensive is it? And that sentiment is shared by people in different political parties. Uh, the French uh, uh, the na Front National, National Front, the, the right, the far right party, um, has long uh, run on a uh, buy French first tariffs, uh, um, a return to the Front, the, the French currency, which economically speaking is pure suicide. Uh, this uh, platform is also shared by um, the far left and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Les Insoumis, uh, that other man who challenged the, the, the parties from the outside. Um, and so the similarities are you know, troubling. He does not want to admit uh, that he shares this economic program with a party that's 180 degrees opposite in terms of uh, uh, immigration, tolerance, uh, it's um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is, is definitely on the on the far left, inclusive, welcoming, etc. Uh, but yes, the, 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 that feeling exists, especially in the deindustrialized era um, areas of France. We have our rust belt in the northeast of France, and it's yes, uh, very prevalent in that area too. President <coughs> Trump is showing a love for Israel. I wonder if uh, President Macron feels the same way? That's a very good question. I think he's extremely cautious. He has that approach that other presidents have had, that is to say, uh, we, France will do everything it can to contribute to a peaceful settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. France has had a long history of uh, being uh, the ally, an ally of, of both in different ways. And uh, on, the, on the Israeli uh, question is very, very cautious. The, the move um, of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem was officially condemned by the French government, but uh, um, yeah, that's a, it is not a priority of France right now to, to change things, in, to, to, to get the two to talk to each other. Uh, Iran is, is a big concern for the French, and the, the, the Iran nuclear deal is um, endorsed and supported by the France, and, and France is unhappy to see the U.S. leave that, uh, that deal. I'd like to ask you a question. Is the Republican Party the party of, of Trump now? Is it a different party? Will Trump change the party forever? What's your take on this? Uh, on this question, how do you feel about it? Is it the same Republican Party as under Mitt Romney? Remember how Mitt Romney, the harsh words he had for Donald Trump when he uh, ran in the primary? What's your take? I think that, yeah, he is, he is the face of the Republican Party. And I, I think that he really is just kind of exposed who they kind of always wanted to be, rather than change them. Um, well, generally speaking, like, both political parties in the United States are kind of fractured right now, because it seems like even two years after the 2016 election, <clears throat> both parties still haven't really um, come to grips with exactly what direction they want to go in, like, you know, especially with the midterms that just happened. The Democrats mm -hmm. are still kind of fighting amongst each other whether or not they want to take a progressive left uh, swing or if they want to stay firmly in the center. And same thing is with the Republicans. There is this, or even now, I think it seems like a fringe coalition now where there's some moderate Republicans that are now <laughs> not really representative in our legislature. Um, and it seems like the Tea Party coalition definitely has now ha ha had a much more, um, con ha now has m larger control over the Republican as Party. The so, yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, any Republican at this point who says that Trump isn't the leader of our party, I, you know, they don't see 
re-election anymore just because, you know, it's, 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 it was very bold for a lot of United States senators up until recently who did not run for re-election to criticize Trump or else they would lose re-election mm -hmm. because, you know, the party would just anoint. But is it a, a de facto alliance? Is it just for the time being or will it endure? It's probably for the long term. Like it's, for it's, the long term. I, I, I think where Trump has taken the Republican Party is probably where it's going to be. And in, in all fairness... Although Trump is definitely being much more outward about like uh, the policies of the Republican Party, like the Tea Party coalition, in many ways he's kind of governing like a lot of Republican presidents have. Like you know he's continuing U.S. foreign policy like centrist Democrats and you know moderate Republicans are in in a probably much more provocative way. But you know definitely like instability kind of still remains. You know the the cozying up to say, you know, special interests or, cor or corporate interests is the same essentially that it, like, m you know, this tax bill that was just passed uh, last year, Mitt Romney would have passed something particularly similar, if not, you know, less, not, not as drastic, but still probably just as detrimental to the economy. But in terms of like rhetoric and like social policies, definitely the Republican Party has moved much farther to the right. And I think that's probably like a long lasting Changing. I, I think that uh, Mr. Trump's an excellent salesman, but I do believe that the younger generation coming up into the political arena is going to impact um, a lot of our political movements into the future. And the Me Too movement has also impacted it. Um, the, the Senate and the Congress puts together a pictorial of all the GOP representatives and all the, uh, Dem uh, the Democrat representatives, and the pictures are very, very different on, between the GOP and the, uh, and the uh, Democratic Party. Just recently elected in this last election, uh -huh. I mean, it is, it is horrendous. Uh, one side of it is all white, uh, white males, and then the other side is very... Um, mixed uh, as far as both male and female and also other Race. nationalities. The Republican Party, had, political parties in the United States very differently from your country are coalitions and who leads uh -huh. them ebbs and flows over time. So thinking of your theme of movements and parties, the United States has been dominated by a two-party system that has seen movements ebb and flow within those parties over time and various movements seem to gain ascendancy. The leadership of the Republican Party has been increasingly the same leadership that ran the Democratic Party in the South and that's the, the politics of segregation in their mindset of uh, the role of courts, the role of law, who has access, distribution of resources the types of divisive politics, the I'm going to do this but blame you for it games. These are very much the day in and day out, the politics of segregation, and they've proven increasingly effective in the Republican Party. I've spoken with and worked with a number of Republican leaders for a very long time who keep saying, this is not the best of America, this is the worst of America. I say, well, why don't you vote the segregationists out? They say, oh, well, they're making us too much money. I was wondering, uh, sorry, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about uh, Emmanuel uh, Macron's uh, popularity presently in France? I know that, that uh, there have been labor reforms that he has proposed, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, uh, labor in, in France as it compares to the United States and sort of the organized movements around, uh, around His labor. His ratings are very low, and this can be explained. I think he's, uh, he has like a... 30, I don't pay attention to opinion polls because we have them every week or so. Um, but he's uh, around 35% of, uh, you know, pop positive perception, positive opinion. Uh, his ratings are very low, just like uh, the ratings of the previous presidents. Uh, it's a trend, French presidents are elected and very quickly they're becoming unpopular. Um, the French vote uh, against... Uh, a candidate in the runoff very often. And in the case of Emmanuel Macron, 
the, 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 the people voted against Marine Le Pen not to have national the front, national fronts, which you know arguably would have been a disaster. Uh, I wouldn't be here probably. No visa, no shutdown of universities. Okay. Anyway, so people voted against uh, the man, and and they find him. So you know they find him disappointing. Um, he. The one thing, he's consistent. He said, I will change, I will reform the labor market. This is what I want to do. And he believes he has a mandate to do these things when really when you factor in turnout and the fact that people voted against Marine Le Pen much more than they voted for Emmanuel Macron, this, man, this mandate is very fragile. And so it's no wonder that he's uh, unpopular, that his approval ratings are so low because... Um, he had a majority of the votes, but not a majority of public opinion, and um, and so he's facing uh, you know difficult times with uh, not only this, but uh, his plans for uh, further integration of the European Union, which was also you know prominent aspect of his political campaign. His ally Angela Merkel in Germany is being challenged by the far right. Uh, she's on her way out, so he's. Uh, these are difficult times for him, for sure. Big test will be next year when uh, elections to the European Parliament will be organized. So, um, I'm trying to see how the word is. So, we have the electoral college vote, but I know you guys have direct democracy. Mm -hmm. Our main concern, and I think what we've been talking lately, is that we don't trust the people to vote directly for a president because apparently we don't know what we want. But <laughs> what is your intake, you know, having that in, in your country? Do you believe people know what they want? Do you think they choose accordingly, or are they just not educated enough to be able to, ch to choose what they really want or what's really good for their country? You know, I, I teach American government and politics, so I explain why the Americans have uh, an electoral college and how, what's the rationale for all this. And yet, I, th I think that you would be much better off with a simple, direct uh, uh, voting system just like the one we have, okay? <laughs> and that it, it makes more sense, it's more transparent, it's, it's just easier. And it's, I, I, it would probably increase voter turnout. Um, having said that, it's, you know, France cannot be said to be an example, even though the French like to think of themselves as, you know, an example um, of, of, of for everything. Um, but <laughs> the French model that's, that comes up regularly, okay, uh, model. Of, but um, the French, just like the Americans, they're educated enough to know what they want. Uh, there's a diversity of uh, candidates that people can choose from. Um, it is a means to foster debate. Um, so, so one of the arguments that I make towards having a direct democracy would be that people will be more inclined to vote because they're, they feel like their vote would actually matter. Um, how involved are people or how do, do people actually know who they're voting for especially I guess the millennial uh, generation are they involved in, in politics I think they're about the same as US millennials um, it depends on the candidate it depends on the issues but generally they're wary of politics they don't, they don't really see the point of, of vote. they don't expect change they don't expect change to come from elections, which is, um, which is sad, I think, which is sad. And that's the reason why those movements seem you know, popular, seem appealing, those movements that are not political parties proper. But Emmanuel Macron had this uh, um, bright idea, I'd say, to have this, uh, his campaign launched with a movement that did not call itself a political party, and now plenty, uh, several other uh, prominent French politicians launched their own movements to try to uh, have that uh, success too. So. Thank you. Uh, 
I just got here, so pardon me if you already answered this question. No problem. Traffic issues. Yeah. Uh, how serious is the idea that Europe ought to have its own military and someone to protect against the U.S., That's China, and India? Uh, I think it's, it's uh, at this stage, I think it's, it's the vision of Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel. Uh, it's a remote reality. Um, what, what's already happening is that we have um, uh, binational battalions, French and German. I see them on the streets of Strasbourg where I live because I live on the border. Uh, and if, the, if a European army comes to life, it will begin on a smaller scale with, let's say, France, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, you know, a small group of countries that agree to put together their resources. But for that, a country like Germany would have to increase its military uh, spending tremendously uh, because uh, for histo obvious historical reasons, um, it does not have a, uh, the army that uh, France has, the, no nuclear uh, arsenal, of course. So there, there, would, be, uh, there would need to be a, a five, uh, appeared when uh, the, the, these uh, partner armies be raised to the level of the, of the French army, which along with the British army are the two most substantial armies in, in Europe. But again, with the Brexit vote, that makes the prospect of a British, French, German army more, more complicated. In, in reference to your voting system, um, here in the United States, we're in the last year and a half or two years have been very uh, <clears throat> aware of the impact of outside uh, other countries. Do you have the same problem, and is your voting system electronic, or is it no, paper? No, it's paper. It's, it's paper. paper. It's and are you, are you worried about any influence in that aspect? There's no plan to have voting machines. I know that uh, after, the, in, in the spring of 2017, after the election of Donald Trump, and as the stories of uh, um, Russian uh, interference uh, emerged, the, the, the French president uh, the outgoing French president warned um, uh, the political parties to be extra careful with their um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, internet security and have uh, to take measures precautionary and, and so they are aware of the threats of uh, Russian interference. Does the populace have a, uh, a voter ID card? Uh, in France, voter uh, registration is much simpler. Uh, what, what you need to have is a, an ID card, and everyone has an ID card. In France, it's, it's uh, compulsory to carry an ID card with you. So I have one with me at all time because you can be asked to you know, prove your identity. To, and so what you need is a, a vo uh, an ID card and a utility bill or a cell phone bill, or, and, and, that's, and you get enrolled. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly simple process. It can be done online now or by the mail. Uh, and by mail and that's the, 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 because we are a unitary state, we do not have states that can interfere in this voter registration uh, process. Same with gerrymandering. Uh, we use a very simple uh, mathematical formula, they, there's a certain amount of population, you have a, a seat, that's, that's a seat in the National Assembly. But again, we, we, we're, we're the size of Texas, so if you want to draw a, make a comparison, geographically speaking, uh, things are simpler because France is, is much, much smaller. Well, Switzerland is a, is a, a federal state too, but uh, so size is not just the explanation, but being a, a relatively small country and a unitary uh, system has its advantages, its drawbacks too, okay, but. Uh, just, just because uh, here in America, whenever we have a national election, we immediately start talking about the next one. Um, like, uh, yeah. even though uh, the current French president has a few more years in his term, uh, given his level of unpopularity, 
do you foresee him winning, winning re-election? Re and if he does not, what possible party of the currently existing parties could That's possibly... That's a very good question. Like, could uh, uh, the, na the National Front or France and Ansumis possibly... I think because I, I don't see those radical left-wing or right-wing parties standing a chance at winning an election. Um, the, the most... Again, it's hard to to see, uh, to, to predict the future. Um, but I think Macron will uh, uh, run for a second uh, a mandate, second term. Um, if he wants to succeed, he'll have to, to kill the two other parties for good, to attract uh, a fraction of the right-wing party called the constructivists, those who want to build with, the, uh, with uh, the, the, the majority. And so he'll have to get them to join his political party or support him and not another candidate. Same with the centrist um, uh, uh, politicians of the Socialist Party, which is really has been empty, is an empty shell right now. So that's, that's the precondition for his success. Um, but it will be tough. It will be tough for him to be reelected. How much corporate financial um, influence do corporations within your country have in political elections and is there a lot of money thrown at election issues? Uh, it's a very good question. Far less influence because uh, political parties of they, they receive uh, public money mostly. Most, they, most of their funding is public. So to qualify for that funding you need to have 5% of the votes, that's the minimum, at a presidential election. Below that, you have to foot the bill yourself. Um, but um, donations by corporations, I'll have to, to double check, but I think they're just downright illegal. So um, that, that's the, the problem of party financing is, is not solved by, this, uh, by these limitations, by these restrictions. Uh, because there's been in the 1980s, 1990s, and still today, scandals, allegations, and, and proven um, instances when uh, rich donors gave uh, suitcases full of uh, money to political parties. Okay, the, the Nicolas Sarkozy, the one who was in office from 2007 to 2012, is said to have received large amounts of cash. Is, is prove, is, nothing was proven, but uh, there's allegation that he uh, got uh, money from a rich uh, French billionaire who was a very old lady and who did not know exactly what she was doing. So uh, that's, that's, that's uh, yeah. But uh, super PACs and all that, no, there's no such thing in, in France. All right, so you've got paper ballots, no gerrymandering, no super PACs. No, um, what's bad about it? <laughs> so what do you what it do you what do you wish out. what do you if you what would you wish were, were different about um, Fr France electoral politics? French electoral. I'm politics. glad you asked because I don't want to give the impression that France is an ideal, perfect country. It's far from it. It's very imperfect. Uh, what I would like to see is obviously more diversity in uh, in the national assembly. Um, Emmanuel Macron has tried. So in terms of uh, age range, it's a younger uh, legislative assembly now. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, minority representation, we are far behind. Race is a taboo in France. It's one of the things that uh, um, distinguishes the two countries. You, you cannot collect uh, data on ethnicity or race or religion. It's forbidden to ask people to identify as a, um, a black, Asian, etc. So we have, a, we have a, a race problem, a racial equality, inequality that's not addressed. And uh, it makes uh, you know, representation of uh, ethnic minorities complicated. So that, there's, certain room, there's certainly room for improvement. Now, I don't see uh, French legislation moving in the direction of the US when, when uh, the census uh, can, uh, does ask those specific questions. That's very unlikely to happen because of a 
complicated, very painful past, that is the past of uh, Vichy France, when during World War II, French, or th the French government uh, um, I discriminated between its uh, uh, Jewish citizens and non-Jewish citizens to deport uh, uh, Jewish uh, fr uh, French Jews. So th there's, a, there's a, a trauma there, and that explains why France is not going anytime soon to um, tackle the problem in a way that could, you know, advance uh, the representation of ethnic minorities. So that's that's um, one area that remains uh, very unsatisfactory as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, greater political, greater turnout, that would be uh, a good thing also to have more people vote. Um, sometimes uh, in, in France people say that we should do like uh, uh, Belgium which makes voting compulsory. Okay, so is that a good idea? Or and you can be fined if you do not vote. Um, and uh, I wish that people could you know, vote for candidates they really like, they really choose, instead of voting against um, uh, the, uh, another candidate. Um, that's, that's, um, that would make French politics more exciting and uh, that would ensure uh, the success of the president once elected. And maybe a, a woman to run France would be a good idea. We, we came close to having a, a female president in 2007. That would be good. That would be a, an interesting evolution. I think France is ready for that. It's a matter of, of finding the right candidate and a bad opponent. Well, thank you for your questions. It's been a very uh, uh, interesting Q&A session, and uh, I hope these, uh, you'll continue to think about these issues of the future of parties, of, of those party systems, those movements, those changes that we, uh, that we experience on a regular basis. And I hope to see you in Strasbourg. Uh, Professor Haji Antik has a great uh, program going on, and uh, it's exciting, and you'll get to meet my students and uh, have fun in this uh, in this beautiful city. I hope to see you soon. Thank you.